Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Sunday morning services of the Evergrace Fellowship Church. This uh, morning, as we begin, we need to take a few moments for silent prayer, remembering that this is the time that the Lord has assigned for us so that we can <clears throat> proceed with our session. Let's take those few moments for silent prayer. I will then close with audible prayer. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we confess to you that our weakness is more than we can estimate, calculate, even give a proper evaluation. And yet, because of this, we turn to you because you are the tower of strength to whom we turn. You are the source of our power and the source of our authority. We thank you, Father, for our alignment and relationship with you. We ask now that God the Holy Spirit might be our instructor and that we might be the infinite gainers of what you have for us this morning. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, folks. <clears throat> let us uh, begin. And uh, let me see if I can get this here. There we go. <clears throat> Today I'm going to give you an introduction to chapter 2 of the book of Exodus. And as you're turning in your Bibles to find the book of Exodus, which is the second book in the Old Testament, I want to remind you that last Sunday, even though we weren't on a face-to-face -face basis, I gave you an introduction to chapter 1. You say, well, that's pretty logical. We can understand that. But now let me throw you a curveball. A few weeks ago, we had an interactive class, and uh, many of you remember how we strung up a clothesline, and we put in different uh, individuals or, or uh, different personalities that appeared in the Bible. And uh, we gave some which were a little difficult to uh, place in their right chronological order. Today, I'm going to announce that we want to have this interactive thing like maybe once a month so that we can kind of stay up with what's going on. And so let's make it the first Sunday of every month, which would be, what, two Sundays from now or three Sundays from now will be the first Sunday in March. So now that I said that, <clears throat> what I want to zero in on is the women of the Bible, because we had a little trouble with the chronology of that the last time. And so we read through the first chapter of the book of Exodus. And now I would like for you to turn to chapter one of Exodus. And I want to read to you. And let me see if I even have it up here. I don't have it here. <clears throat> Exodus chapter one. And let me uh, begin to read at uh, verse 12. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 12. This is what it says. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread out, so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. The Egyptians compel the sons of Israel to labor rigorously, verse 14, and they made their lives bitter and with hard labor in mortar and bricks and all kinds of labor in the field. All their labors, which they rigorously imposed on them. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was Shifra, you want, maybe you want to underline that one, and the other was named Pu'ah. These are two women who are mentioned in the Bible, and they had an enormously important task to do. Now you only hear them mentioned 
here in this passage, well, there's a couple of other places in, in the Old Testament where genealogies are, uh, are given. But here are two women whose names are hardly recognizable. So I want you to remember these two names. Shifra and, oh, I can't remember the other name. What is it? It's like Pu, you know, oh, Pu, Pua. Pua, Shifra and Pua. Two very important women, and they are midwives. Okay, now, one of the reasons that I say this is because scholars have debated as to who these women are, and I, I'll give you etymology on this later, but uh, they seem to think that this is a mother and a daughter. And they make, uh, shall I say, abstruse connections and they come up with this conclusion that Shifra was the mother and Pua was the daughter. One was the one who would pull the baby out through the birth canal and Pua would be the one who would clean the baby up and get it ready for mother. So what other names that these two ladies have? They suggest that the mother was Moses' mother and that the daughter was Moses' sister, the one who, you know, looked after the baby in the basket in the Nile River. Okay, so I'm giving you this so that you have, you can put these weird names together with some context. So, we are now ready to begin with Exodus uh, chapter 2. And we begin, first of all, with the names of the 12 sons of Israel, or the 12 children of Israel, the, the, the children of Israel, as it is often referred to in the King James Bible. And there are 12 of them. Now... You're probably asking, does Pastor want us to memorize these 12 names? Well, halfway. Uh, and by that, I mean that you should at least know that some of these names have some importance. The first of these is Reuben, and he is the one who slipped into the bed of his father and slept with one of his wives. Since he was the firstborn, he lost the right to primogeniture, so he lost the blessing. The next guy is Simeon, and Simeon was that hothead, along with Reuben, who went into the city of uh, the young boy named Shechem, and um, they killed all the males who had been circumcised the night before. And they not only did that, but they went and then they, they lamed or they made lame all the cattle that were in that city. And as a result, their father, Jacob, said, you two boys are so filled with violence, I can't pass on to you the legacy of Jacob slash Israel. Then there's Levi. Levi became the tribe of the priests in Israel. Levi became the tribe of the priests. Then that's followed by Judah. And Judah is the tribe from whom Jesus sprang. This is the same tribe of David and Solomon and all the good kings in the southern kingdom. And this is the tribe from which the Lord Jesus came, both Joseph and Mary both came from this particular tribe. Then we have two others, Issachar and Zebulun. We don't know very much about them, and so I don't expect you to remember very much about them. Number seven is Dan. Dan is the tribe from which the Antichrist comes. Okay, so you have Judah, which is number four, and you have Dan, which is the substitute. This is where the Antichrist comes from. Naphtali 
don't necessarily want you to know very much about that. Gad, not very much. Asher, not very much. Joseph, Joseph didn't really have a tribe. His father passed the tribe on to his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So if you add Ephraim and Manasseh to this list, you come up with 13 tribes, but then you have to subtract Levi because Levi didn't get any land, then you go back to 12 tribes. So there's a little wrinkle in all of this. And then Benjamin. Benjamin is that particularly cruel tribe. This is the tribe from which Saul came from, that is King Saul, Jonathan, his son, and the Apostle Paul. They were very zealous when they were zealous, and they were very, very cruel. So those are those names. Now, because we're going to encounter certain individuals in chapter 2, we need to take a look at the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi is the tribe that uh, is dedicated to the priesthood in Israel. Levi had three sons, Gershom, Kohath, and Mirari. I know, they're names that are pretty hard to remember. As you learn more and more about the Bible, you will become more acquainted with Kohath, the one in the middle, because he shows up time and again in the, in the chapters of the Old Testament. Gershom, Kohath, and Merari, those are the sons of Levi. <coughs> Kohath had four sons. And you should be able to see them on her. Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. And you'll notice that I highlighted Amram, or I made him a little bit more prominent. Can you guys see that from, from back there? Because uh, I have a hard time seeing it on my screen here, and I was hoping that you guys could see it okay. Okay, so Kohath is now the son of Levi, and Amran, Ishar, Hebron, and Uziel are the grandchildren of Levi. Big deal. Amram is the father of three people. Moses is the most famous. The other two are none other than Aaron, who became the high priest, and Miriam, who was the the babysitter, the girl that was by the riverside watching to make sure that Moses didn't drown. So, all of these people that we have here come from Kohath. Now, the reason that this is important to us is because in chapter 2 of Exodus, we have these words. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. And let me see if I can highlight this. Okay, here's Levi. And so a man of the tribe of Levi, his name was Amram, went and married a daughter of the tribe of Levi. And they had three sons. Their names were Aaron, Miriam, and Moses. Moses was the baby. Okay, earlier this morning, I said to you, we need to remember the names of the women in the Bible. So when we had that clothesline put up there, we had the name Jochebed. And Jochebed is the mother of Moses. We know the father of Moses is Amram. We just read that. So who was the mother? Jochebed. And where does she fit in? Okay, let me show you. Hmm. Here we are. What about Jochebed? Where does she come in? <clears throat> Jochebed 
apparently was the sister of Kohath. Okay, now follow, follow me here, okay? That means that Amram married his aunt. What is the message for us here? Suppose that you are the child of a marriage that isn't quite kosher. Does God still have a plan for your life? Well, we have three people here that figure very prominently in the plan of God. We have Moses, the greatest personage of the Old Testament, stands out head and shoulders above everybody else. And then there's his brother, Aaron, who is the first high priest, renowned because he was the first high priest. And then we have Miriam, who was the caretaker of Moses. And we see in the book of Numbers, for instance, that both Moses, that both uh, Aaron and Miriam would say to Moses, hey, listen, why do you think that God wants to speak exclusively through you? What are we, chopped liver? We come from the same parents as you. We have jobs that have been important to God. And then the Bible tells us that they were struck with leprosy because God appointed only Moses to be the leader. So I want you to take this away from this particular point, and that is it doesn't matter what your parentage was. You may have come from inbreds. In the state of Washington, there's certain valleys which are filled with inbreds. God still can use you. It doesn't matter if one or both of your parents had some kind of illegal connection. God can still take care of you. Okay, so here you see Jacobet, Exodus 6.20. And then, well, if you would open your Bibles, please, we'll look at this uh, and read it. Uh, Exodus chapter 6 and verse 20. And verse 20 says, Amram married his father's sister, Jochebed. Very first words in verse 20. And she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the length of Aram's life was 137 years. <clears throat> Okay, now it's important for us to, to deal with that because sometimes we get the impression, well, I come from a bad descendancy. Uh, my ancestors were illegal. They were moonshiners. They were incestuous. They're... Guess what? God still has a plan for you. And that is such a fantastic thing. That is the grace of God. Okay. Now let's talk about the delta of the Nile. And you can see the delta of the Nile. It's that green triangle toward the top of the land of Egypt with a long blue line, which is the um, River Nile. Let me see if I can get it up here. Here's the River Nile. You can see it's almost as wide as the Red Sea, so it's a pretty big place and there's a little lake there we won't mention that but here is this triangular area it's called the Nile Delta and the Di Nile Delta is still famous because it is a very prolific land it is very fructiferous it is very productive when it comes to making things work the Nile Delta has a bunch of canals and, or we could call them rivulets because the Nile River is so big and the Delta is so big that the water has to escape and go somewhere. The Egyptians were ingenious and they built 
canals between these rivulets to make their land that much more fertile. Now, as you look at this delta, and uh, I will ask you if you can figure out where in this river system would have that basket been placed that carried the baby Moses. We don't know. The Bible just doesn't say it. it says it was by the reeds and by the side of the river, but we just don't know. There's a point here, and that is that no matter how difficult it is to find that spot, and God has his eye on you. He watches you. He cares for you. And you may live in Seattle, and God takes care of you even there. You may live in Marysville or further north. God takes care of you. And you would say, well, I am surrounded by crime and criminals and bad things. God takes care of you. Do you know that Moses was in the same river with crocodiles? God took care of him and took care of his parents. <clears throat> okay, the 18th dynasty. The 18th dynasty. We recall from last week that there were 30 dynasties in the whole history of Egypt. Each dynasty had at least six kings. So we're talking about tons and tons of people that lived in the history of Egypt. And so we picked out the 18th dynasty because that is the one that is the most commonly accepted as being the dynasty in which Moses lived. In other words, it was the daughter of, the, of one of the pharaohs in the 18th dynasty who picked him up out of the river. And it was in the 18th dynasty that Moses grew up in the palace of Pharaoh and he was on the same level as his other sons. And there are famous names which are attached to the 18th dynasty. And so having said that, let me Move this up. <clears throat> Probably the most famous that we are familiar with is Tutankhamun, King Tut. And we have seen uh, from museum exhibitions and the things of the sort that King Tut was very, very wealthy, that the things that were buried with him were extremely, extremely expensive, of a great deal of value. And this apparently is the same dynasty in which Moses was adopted or accepted. Now, Egyptologists tell us that the 18th dynasty was the most formidable, the wealthiest, the most powerful, the richest of all the dynasties. And all the dynasties were fabulously rich. But the 18th dynasty was more than the rest. Now this 18th dynasty was destroyed by one man without even using a sword, and his name was Moses. He just... The crops of Israel or the crops of Egypt were destroyed. The religion of Egypt was destroyed. The Nile River with all its produce was destroyed. There were 10 mighty plagues that beset Egypt, all because Moses was following the word of God. And then when the people were released from the bondage of Egypt and they went and they crossed the Red Sea and uh, were about to cross the Red Sea, the Egyptians' soldiers, their uh, chariot units and their infantry all pursued Israel and they pursued them right into the opened up Red Sea, and then the sea closed down upon them, and the military of the mightiest nation on earth was eclipsed. 
That is what God can do. And I want you to take this into consideration because God can do marvelous things in your life. And this is proof of it. When we observe the Lord's table, we are going all the way back to the Passover, which is chapter 12, the book of Exodus. And that should remind you that our Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, paid the penalty for your sins, but he also brought on you the blessings of God. And that is fantastic. Okay. Hebrew midwives. Well, what were their names? You guys remember? She, Fra, and Pua. There you go. And uh, here's an old painting from uh, sometime in the past. And notice that there are two midwives that are mentioned because these are two that are mentioned in chapter one of the book of Exodus. Here you have a papyrus that is taken from uh, uh, one of the places in Egypt. And uh, this depicts the birth of a child. You see the mother who is delivering a child. The baby's just come through the birth canal. One of the midwives is pulling the baby out from the birth canal. That uh, baby is then handed over to a second midwife who then takes the baby and hands it to the third, who cleans the baby up, puts it in a receiving blanket, gives it to the mother. This actually happened. So what do we do with that middle? Let me see if I can get here. What do we do with this middle midwife here? Well, they didn't have movies and they didn't have videos in those days. And so in order for them to show movement, Sometimes they threw in an extra figure so that you could see it. And so it looks to me like there were really only two midwives. It's just that the one in the middle was how the transfer took place. Okay. The Bible tells us that the mother of Moses put Moses in a teba. Teba. And it is exactly the same word that is used in Genesis chapter 6 for Noah's Ark. It's not used anywhere else. This is a life-saving flotation device. This is to save life. What was Moses' mother thinking? She was thinking, I don't want to kill my baby. I want to save my baby. So she put the baby into a basket, into an ark that was going to float on the Nile River. What did she think? That a crocodile was going to come and eat it? No, she sent her older, uh, or the daughter, to keep an eye on that. Why? Because she was going to shoo away the crocodiles. She was going to pull the basket in so that the crocodiles wouldn't get to it. She wanted to save this baby. And the Bible commends her for it. Now, I don't want to get into the subject of abortion, but you have here very definite that God prizes the preservation of life, even when the life belongs to a little baby. And that is because God has plans for each person once they believe. And here you have Pharaoh's daughter along with her attendants picking up the baby. And it looks like it's looks like a basket from QFC or Fred Meyer or something, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's supposed to be, uh, you know, an ark. And off to the left, you have the little girl named Miriam who is the babysitter who's taking care of Moses. The Nile River is famous for its crocodiles. It's not that there are just a few there. There are a lot there. The river is not only full of fish, but it has birds. It has all kinds of animals that come to its shores. And the crocodiles, well, they become very, very populated there because there's lots of food there. So putting that baby 
in the Nile River was a desperate act on the part of the mother. And we know the rest of the story. She named him Moses and said, because I drew him out of the water. She named him Moses. Okay, let me tell you what the Hebrew name for Mo or the Hebrew word for Moses is. The name is Moshe. Have you heard of a very famous Israeli general named Moshe Dayan? He's the guy with an eye patch. Moshe. Okay. How many of us know of people yeah. whose names are Moses? Not very many of us, but in the world, the name Moses is more popular than it is here in the United States. Okay, now let me ask you this. How many people do you know whose name is Tutankhamun? Okay, so Moses is better off than Tutankhamun. How many people do you know whose name is Ramses? How about Thutmos? You know, and these people were pharaohs of the mightiest nation on earth. And we don't know their names, but we know the name of Moses. We know the name of Moses because God used him. And God wants to use you as well. Now, let me show you the uh, business with the etymology here. Okay, first of all, we have Moshe, which is Moses in Hebrew. You have the first letter here is an M or a main. Then there's a dot up above. I don't know if you can see it very well there. Can you see it with the cursor? Or should I use the red one? Can you see it this way? Okay, that's an O, so Mo. The next letter is this. It looks kind of like a W. It's called the Sheen. And it makes the sound shh, like that. And um, it's supposed to look like a jaw with teeth. So when you have all of your teeth, you can say shh. When you don't, it's hard to say shh. <laughs> and so right below the sheen, you have three dots in an opposite uh, to a pyramid. So you have two on the top, one on the bottom. It's called a, uh, this is an E for our purposes. And then it's followed by the letter H, which is this letter here. Kind of looks like a seven with a little leg here. And then there's a space in between. You've heard of the jots and the tittles. Well, this is, a, this is a, an example of a jot and a tittle. This letter will never change. And when it does, then maybe the word of God would change. So it's mo she. When you have a he or an h following the e like that, it's called a historic. And that means that it's not going to change. So mo she. Now, she said, I drew him out of the river, out of the water. And you'll notice it is an M, just like it is up above. But instead of having an O above the letter, it has an A at the bottom. This is called a comets or an A. Ah. Then you have your sheen, just like above. And then you have another comets. So now it's Ma Sha, followed by a historic. And so in Hebrew, the radicals or the consonants stay the same when the meaning is the same. And it's only the vowels that change when certain adaptations need to be taken. And so one is the name of a person. The other is a verb. I have drawn him from the water. And that is a fantastic thing. Now, the other kings in the 18th dynasty had as part of their name, Moshe, at the end. But they were called the God of the water. 
or the God that came out of the water, or the God that lives in the water, or something like that. But not Moses. Moses is just Moses. And that is fantastic. And so let me put it to you this way. You with God make a majority. You with another God, nobody will ever remember your name. Everybody knows who Moses is. Moses was a prince in Egypt. So what does that mean? It means that he grew up in the noble house or in the royal house. And so let me read to you verses that pertain to that description of Moses. The first one is Exodus 2 and verse 11. And this is what it says. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Notice that it says he went out. It means he went out of the royal house, and he started to live with, or he started to associate with the Hebrew brethren who were slaves in Egypt. Now, New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, says, by faith, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment like a slave with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So instead of wanting to live in the palace with all the nobility and all of the um, pampering that was done to the royal uh, personnel, he would much rather associate with the people of God. Acts chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. And this is somebody giving a history of Israel. And this is what it says. Pharaoh's daughter took him away, nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians. And he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered into his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. So Moses was a prince in Israel. He wasn't just a nobody. God took him from the river and elevated him to a place of prominence in the mightiest nation on earth, the 18th dynasty for crying out loud. But we don't know we don't see his name in the chronologies. Now, last time I mentioned chronologies to you. The chronology of Manitho. Remember, he's the one who said there were 30 of these dynasties. But he was alive at the 30th. And so he put together all the other ones by legends and by things that he read. It was more or less a historian. So he wrote a history that embraced over 2,000 years. So obviously he wasn't there for that, so he had to take everybody's word. Because of that, more recent scholars have said, well, Manitho had a good idea, but he wasn't there for the 2,000 years. We need to do more scientific research. And so there have been different chronologies. The most credible up to date is one, by a fellow by name of Corville. Now, I didn't put that name up there last week, but Corville and another fellow uh, said, you know what? Some of these dynasties overlapped because Egypt was northern uh, Egypt, which is lower, and southern Egypt, which is upper, and they both had pharaohs. And because they didn't have the internet like we do today, and they didn't have transportation as fast as we do today, these two kings often were at war with each other, and one uh, would overcome the other, or the both of them were at the same time. And when Manitho wrote down his chronologies, he just bunched them all together. So that reduces the time as to when which dynasty ruled when. So what we do know, and we hold the Bible to be true, 
is that Moses was a prince in Israel, even though the Egyptian chronologies have omitted him. It's just like he never existed. And then the last two verses of Exodus chapter 2 tells us that God heard the groaning of his people. And so let me get to this. And that is that <clears throat> God hears you when you pray. He hears you when you tell him that you hurt. He hears you when you tell him that you're suffering. And maybe he doesn't send an immediate fix, a spontaneous gratification, but he does hear. And he will send relief. For those of us in the church age who may die because of our diseases, terminal or not, we will receive resurrection bodies. No more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. I was uh, toying with uh, a, a Christian that I've known for some time, and um, <clears throat> I said to him, do you think your grandchildren will recognize you in heaven? He said, I don't know. How about, do you think your grandparents will recognize you if they were Christians? He said, oh yeah, they were Christians. You think they'll recognize you? I mean, look at you, you're 86 years old. What age are you going to be? And for us, we don't know what we assume because the Bible says, and we shall be like him for we will see him as he is. Jesus went to be at the right hand of the father at age 33. The book of Revelation tells us that when John saw the lamb, he knew who it was. He was the lamb that seemed like he was slain. So he knew who he was, recognizable, glorified, but recognizable. So what are you going to look like? We will see him as he is. That's all that the Bible tells us. Okay, let's turn in our Bibles then to Hebrews chapter 2, and we will read this passage. This is what it says. Beginning at verse 1 of Exodus chapter 2. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived, bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the, by the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile, with her maidens walking alongside the Nile, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away, nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, Turn the page here because I drew him out of the water. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up 
that he went out to his brethren and he looked on their hard labors and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that. And when he saw there was no one around, he struck him down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. He went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? But he said, Who made you the prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, Surely the matter has become known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian, Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill their troughs of, to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them water their flock. When they came to Rewell, their father, he said, Why have you come back so soon today? So they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And what is more, he even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, Where is he then? Why is it that you have left the man behind? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses was willing to dwell with a man and gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Okay, here's another lady's name, Zipporah. I like that. Then she gave birth to a son, and she named him Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in the foreign land. And it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died. And the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage. And they cried out, and their cry rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. Okay, thus we read the Lord's word. All hail the power of Jesus' name is a popular hymn sung by many Christian denominations. This hymn is often referred to out. as the National Anthem of Christendom. The lyrics, written by Edward Perrinan while he served as a missionary in India. Edward Perrinan was born in Sundridge, England in 1726 and died in Canterbury in 1792. His family came from the Huguenots of Switzerland and, according to the U.M. hymnal editor Carlton Young, was closely associated with and esteemed by the Wesleys. The lyrics of this hymn, originally eight verses, were written by Edward uh, Perrinet in 1779. The first title was On the Resurrection, The Lord is King. Only the first verse was originally published in the Gospel magazine in November 1779, anonymously. All eight verses were later published in the April 1780 issue and were accompanied by an acrostic poem that spelled out Edward Perrinet, revealing the author. Edward Perrinet was ordained into the Anglican Church, but eventually deferred to the evangelical movement of John and uh, Charles Wesley.
the doctrine of congregational singing. Now, <clears throat> let us uh, begin with this section and the textual basis for this or the text for this sermon is Psalm 96 verses 1 through 3. This is what they say. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among the peoples. I divided this sermon into three major sections. Number one, singing is commanded by God. We saw that uh, in the verses that we just read. Secondly, singing is a means of indoctrination. And we also saw that in the verses that we just read. Verse two, and then verse three, singing is a means of evangelism. In other words, it's a way of getting the word out to the rest of the world. So we are right now tracking in verse two, singing as a means of indoctrination. What is indoctrination? Indoctrination means that you are substituting a certain series of thoughts or a certain number of values into what you used to have before and now you will have new values. Uh, this has traditionally been done by churches since the earliest, well, won't say the earliest, maybe 300s, 400 AD is when they began with catechisms. And this is where you begin to learn, you know, I believe in God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, you know, the uh, Apostles' Creed. That's indoctrination. Children were taught that. Adults were taught that. You repeat it every Sunday in church because this is what you believe. I believe is the way that it begins. Doctrination, indoctrination. So, verse two says, uh, bless his name and then proclaim good tidings. It's the word proclaim that brings us to the subject of indoctrination. So, the word proclaim Okay, it uh, is there, um, It uh, I've got it in gold letters for some reason or other, it's not showing up on the screen, so let's just move on. The name proclaim or the word proclaim is the Hebrew word basar, B-A-S-A-R. Now there are a number of meanings that go with that, and so we started with letter A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and now we are on letter H. And this is an indoctrination means the reshaping of our thinking. So when we talk about indoctrination, it means that we are changing the way in which we think. There's a fairly, well, I don't know how popular it is, but I think it's fairly popular. There's a popular radio show on Christian radio and I won't mention the name, but uh, it's one of those call-in programs. And I've heard several times that somebody has called in and uh, has asked the question, now that we are saved and we are still human beings and we are prone to sin, why didn't God just eradicate sin so that we wouldn't be plagued with it? Or, as I learned when I was going to school, uh, why didn't the Lord just call us home the moment that we believe in Christ's personal Savior? Let's say it's on a Sunday evening uh, evangelistic service. Somebody comes forward to the altar, they confess Christ, and boom, they're dead and they're gone. Why didn't God do that? Well, the reason for that the reason that God allows you to live after you've believed in Christ as your personal Savior is so that your thinking will be revamped. Your thinking will be renewed. And it will be renewed along certain lines, but primarily the chief goal of Christianity is to renew our thinking 
concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. You started this renewal when you stopped saying, well, Jesus was a historical figure, or Jesus was a great baker. He could turn rocks into bread, or Jesus was a miracle worker. Or Jesus was a fantastic teacher. Now you say, Jesus is my savior. That's a renewal of your thinking. So there are three areas in regards to Jesus that the believer needs to now incorporate into his thinking. First of all, know him as your savior. This is what sometimes is called Operation SAC, you know, like Strategic Air Command. First, you know him as your savior. Now, you may not know very much and you may trip over your words and you may make all kinds of theological mistakes, but you know him as your savior. Secondly, as you grow in the Lord, you know him as the administrator of the church. In other words, he is the head of the church and he is appointed Delegates, the first delegates were apostles. The apostles passed off the scene, but they trained pastor teachers. And those pastor teachers have taught other pastor teachers and on down the line through the centuries to the point where we have pastor teachers today and a true pastor teacher is under the administration, the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is one reason why a true pastor teacher has short hair, because he honors his head. The pastor who has long hair doesn't honor his head. Why? Because he's not under the authority of his head, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who has the candlesticks in his hand. He is the one who removes candlesticks. In other words, he decides what churches should go where and which churches should cease to exist. And he removes the candlesticks. He is the administrator, the chief administrator of the church. When a pastor or a congregation does not recognize that, they are not a church. So that brings to us a question. That's maybe a subtle question to some, but what kind of government should a church have? Well, there are those that say the uh, church should have a congregational form of government. That's generally what Baptists say. And that means that everybody in the church votes to make policy for the church. And uh, so let's say the policy has to do with baptism. The congregational vote, and they'll say something like, you can't be a member of this church unless you're baptized. And others will say, you can't even be a Christian unless you're baptized. I was in one of the biggest churches in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Philadelphia. You often see it in the news. And their policy is, you can't be a Christian unless you go to the front of the church and you confess your sins. That's the policy. And everybody voted on it, so they must be right. And so the question is, is the majority always right? Well, there are those who say that when the majority speaks, you have heard the voice of God. Then there are those who say, well, it's not quite exactly like that. The way that it is, is that uh, you have to have a layer of authorities. And so you have Christ as the chief authority, and he has appointed a board to make the decisions, like the Presbyterians. They're called Presbyterians because there's a presbytery, there's a hierarchy. And whatever the board of elders decides, that is going to be the policy. And they say, well, we can't just do that. We need to have a big board, and that's called the presbytery. And so the denomination of the Presbyterians meet once or twice a year, something like that, and they make a policy. In the 1960s, they made a policy that we no longer believe in prayer. We no longer believe that God is the God of the Bible. And so 
1960, the Presbyterian Church officially left the ranks of traditional Orthodox Christians. Well, what went wrong? Well, what went wrong is that one of the main concepts about Christ was thrown out the window. Is he the chief administrator or is the board, the presbytery, the chief administrator? This also comes down to the individual who sits in the pew. Is the man who is teaching from behind the pulpit appointed by the Lord or not? Well, there are some churches that say, well, so long as he's a graduate of the seminary. And there is a very big seminary, just, uh, well, part of it's just north of us in Vancouver, Trinity School of, uh, of Divinity. And my brother-in-law is a graduate of that. He's no pastor. There are lots of people who have gone through that school. They're not pastors. There's a lot of them that have gone through Southern uh, Baptist Seminary. They're not pastors. There's a lot of them that have gone through Dallas Theological Seminary. They're not pastors. A pastor is appointed by Jesus Christ. So in the old days, the saying was, are you called to the ministry? In other words, Jesus does the call and you do the listening. Are you responding to the call? And that was the terminology that was used. We hardly ever use it anymore because seminaries have grown to such prominence that so long as you've got one of these diplomas hanging on your wall, you're worthless. We in categorical circles have not only resisted that, but we have militated against it. And we say, no, 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 no. You don't even put initials behind our names. And what's more, you don't have to call us doctor such and such. You don't have to call us reverend such and such. You can go ahead and just call us by our first name. And that informality smacks in the ears of some people because it's too familiar. But that's the, that's the terminology that we use here. Pastor Jesse, it's great. Why? Because I'm no different than you except that the Lord has called me to the ministry. I would give anything away to be in the ministry. Nothing is more important to me than that. Why? Because that is my calling. Now, if somebody comes up and they say, well, we'd like to offer you a job like the CIA did to me. Wouldn't you rather uh, go with us to South America and break uh, the cartels? Just think, you get up in the morning, Nobody knows where you're going. You'll back by, by nightfall. And all your neighbors will think that you just go to the office and you come back. At the end of so many years, you can retire and your family will have a nice uh, stipend and everything. That's not me. And for a while, I was blinded by my own ambition. I wanted to go on city council. I, I ran for politics. Not once, but twice. It's not me. So the second area is the area that Jesus Christ is the administrator of the church. This is why almost every single epistle begins with Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or a bond servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say a graduate from the most distinguished seminary in Jerusalem, studied under Gamaliel. It doesn't say that. He says, I've got a lot of things to be proud of. A Hebrew of the Hebrews, born of the tribe of Benjamin, of zealous, of zeal, full of zeal. It doesn't say that. Why? Because that's not as important, you see. And then the third tier, and this is the one which a lot of people have trouble with, and that is to remember that Jesus Christ is the commander in chief of the armies in heaven. This is why the book of Revelation was written. 
The book of Revelation was not written so that you would know who the Antichrist was. It wasn't written so you would know about the trumpet judgments. It was written so that you would know how powerful your Savior is. But you know you're not going to have capacity for that until you've grown to that level. And so wonderful as the book of Revelation is, it points the believer to the grandeur of Jesus Christ. It points to the fact that he is not just royalty here on earth, but royalty in heaven. In fact, he's royalty in every aspect of the universe. And he is the one who calls the shots. He calls the shots on the trumpet judgments. He calls the shots on the bowl judgments. He calls the shots on the uh, whore of, of uh, Babylon. Let's just go there. He is the one who was in charge of the great white throne judgment. He is the one who's in charge. And yes, here we are 2,000 plus years since the cross. And people make fun of Jesus. But in our hearts, we know that he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, we may not see it now, but we thrill knowing that one day the whole world will resound with his praises. And as the Bible says, even the trees and the mountains and the rocks, they will clap, they will sing glorifying Jesus Christ. And we glory in that. So here are three areas which are very, very primary in the reshaping of our minds. So point number two, singing shapes our thinking. Singing shapes our thinking. The more we sing truth, the more the truth shapes us. Let me repeat. The more we sing truth, the more the truth shapes us. This is why it's important for us to sing and to sing songs which give us the truth. Singing what God has done for us is singing the truth. Now here is an example. On a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross. What's that? That's the truth. He died on the cross for me. The cross was rugged. It was rustic. It was, uh, it was rough. It was not like fine wood today. And one day I'm going to trade in my trophies for that rugged cross. What is that? That's truth. And it shapes your life. Now, the day that you give up singing songs of truth is the day that you're going down the, the trail in the handbasket. And, you know, there are some very beautiful and wonderful modern songs. But the Christian public has turned into a consumer public. And today, this song is popular. Tomorrow, we no longer sing it in our church. I tell you, I believe that hymns that are sung should not have a date, should not have a date as this is old, this is, this is uh, new or uh, more recent. They should be sung for the purpose of inscribing and implanting truth in our lives. So our life is shaped by the truth that we sing. Let me give you an example of how this happens. Some years ago, and I don't know if you can see, Nancy Sinatra sings one of my favorite songs. It's got such a catchy tune. Come on. She sings, these boots are made for walking, and that's just what they'll do. These boots are going to walk all over you. Haven't you guys ever heard that song? I know maybe it's, <laughs> maybe it's 50 years ago. <laughs> but you know, that puts a mental attitude in us. Right? Nobody's going to walk on me. Nobody's going to trifle with my feelings, my emotions. If they do, I'm going to walk all over them. I'm going to get even with them. Yes, I've got my key and I'm going to key his four-wheel drive. I'm going to take my knife. I'm going to cut his leather seats. 
in this four-wheeler. You heard the country and western side. The more you sing truth, the more truth shapes your life. The more you sing garbage. You know, I, sh I should maybe quote from Martin Luther because he called it pig dung. The more you <laughs> sing pig dung, the more you're going to be like pig dung. We bring our doubts, we bring our fears to the truth when we sing in church. And it's here that we apply the truth to our doubts and our fears. And it's important, it's incumbent upon us, this church, that we should sing songs that bespeak the truth. <clears throat> what this means is that you should write and sing songs which are robust with doctrinal content which are rich with biblical text, which have a doctrinal contour to them. Let me enlarge on this a little bit. <clears throat> we, that is the pastor teacher and the song leader need to be intentional in congregational singing. The word intentional is the key word here. Intentional means that we have an agenda. We have something that we need to say, something that we need to teach with the songs that we sing. They're not just a little garland that we've set up like at Christmas time uh, so that it's, I don't know, just an adornment to our church services. Singing truthful songs is part of true worship. And so we, and I'm the one that has to take full responsibility for this, and the song leader who takes a little less responsibility. We have to be intentional. We have to have a purpose. We have to have an agenda when it comes to congregational singing. This is one of the reasons why I have pressed upon you as a congregation. We need to learn these songs by heart. It's an agenda. Why? Because I want to infiltrate your minds. I want to fill your minds. I want to saturate your minds with the truth that is found in some of these songs. Now, they may not be entirely scripture, but they have the contour of doctrine. And that will oftentimes carry you through in a, in a pinch. Okay. So let me see if I can show you what I mean. <clears throat> we, the PT and the song leader, should ask ourselves this question. How was the singing on Sunday? Okay, we just sang a hymn earlier today. So here's a question I gotta ask myself. How was the singing today? I'll tell you, it wasn't the way that I wanted it. There had to be some changes. One change that I would automatically make is that when we have a recorded musical accompaniment, it's the recording that calls the shots, not the song leader. Because you hear that instrument coming through the speakers loud and clear, and the song leader, he's kind of like a prop that doesn't really matter. So eventually, we want to get rid of all that recording. So in order for us to stay on pitch or to have music, we need to have somebody who can play an instrument. Now, you guys were here when we had the hymn sing. 
Wasn't it better when an instrument was played? When, didn't there was, wasn't there an uplift to your soul? Of course there was. And the song leader was leading, you were responding, it was fantastic. So this is one of the things that I want to do. We're kind of hampered. We're kind of like on crutches because we don't have instrumentalists. And this person doesn't have a whole lot of musical talent. So did the singing go the way that I intended it? Yeah, I guess if we assign a number to it, we'd say maybe a four out of the 10, maybe a five. <coughs> Did I keep the congregation together? I tried by singing louder and singing more uh, emphatically. But you can't help it. You hear the instrument coming through the speakers and it gets you every time. Did I explain any musical quirks? No. Did I explain any doctrinal quirks? No. That needs to be done. And uh, Mike, when you listen to this, this is for you. It's not just for me. This is also for you. If there's a doctrinal quirk in the song, we have to point it out and say, this isn't true. We sing it like this because there's poetic license, it rhymes better, or we do it because it's traditional. I, I think of the song, you know, what can wash my sins away? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Okay. It's got doctrinal contours. But it mentions the word blood in there. We have to make a course correction. We have to be able to show that. Those of you who are tuning in midweek, you're going to get some of that when I, I go through the blood of Christ. But you have, you have to know that so that when you sing, you're not just singing absent-mindedly. And if the blood of Christ is mentioned, automatically the mature believer will say, I know what that's talking about. It's talking about the spiritual death of our Lord Jesus Christ, i.e., this is the second death that he has avoided for me. What is the second death? Remember, being cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. And if all you hear is the blood of Christ and you think that it's some kind of a magic charm and you just hold up in front of the devil and he will go away from you, forget about it. So, questions for the congregation. Just like there's the question for the pastor teacher and the song leader, there's questions for you as a congregation. And so I'm giving you this and I'm giving you this warning. Do not become judgmental. You'll get under discipline. And when you're under discipline, your life will go from, well, it'll go to miserable. And you don't need that. So don't say, well, the singer, the, the, the song leader was this, was that, or he was missing this, he was missing that. Do not be judgmental. So the first question that you need to ask yourself is, did I sing to the Lord or was I self-conscious? Now, the self-consciousness means I would have sung more, but I didn't know the tune. I didn't want to blurt out a mistake. I didn't. When you sing, you sing as unto the Lord. Don't sing so that the person next to you will say, well, that person is a good singer, the person is a bad singer. You sing as unto the Lord. That is what is necessary. Secondly, did I understand the message of the lyrics? Did I understand the message of the lyrics? And thirdly, did I follow the song leader? Now, we haven't done this, but when we do, it is well with my soul. There's a time when I say, you know, sing more softly. You follow usually, okay? Why is this important? And I'll get to this a little bit uh, sooner, but you know, when you have 
a well-disciplined group, that group sings in unison. When you have an orchestra and that orchestra has practiced and practiced and practiced, when the conductor raises his baton, they're all ready to play and they're going to play the exact notes that they have been practicing. And when they all play together, despite the fact that they have different parts, it sounds beautiful. Now, why is that important to you? Because, first of all, God is listening. That's the first thing. Secondly, because he's not the only one that's listening. There is a universe full of angelic intelligences. And the fallen angels listen to you and they say, my goodness, these people really love Jesus Christ. They're not just there with their thumb in their mouth. Look at them. They're singing in unison. Each and every one of them believe in Jesus Christ. Each and every one of them depends on God for his sustenance. And they're not ashamed to sing it and to sing it loud and be proud. So, letter C, did you follow the song leader? Letter B. We, pastor, teacher, song leader, need to model singing to the congregation. How are we doing here for time? We started seven minutes late, so. I want to get all my time out of this. <laughs> Number one, teach the congregation the importance of knowing the lyrics by heart, if possible. I mean, nobody is so unreasonable to think that you are going to remember every single lyric after just practicing it for a few weeks. These hymns, you have to sing them in your heart year after year because they become precious to you. And then you don't sing just from memory. You sing because that has become precious to you. I think of one of those songs that has little, little textual background but has a lot of personal, shall we say, experience. What is it? I come to the garden alone when the dew is still on the roses. Where in the Bible do you hear anything about dew on your roses? You just don't. But what it is saying is that it's a very pleasant time for you. And you are blessing the Lord, like it says in Psalm 96 and verse 2. Bless the Lord. So it is our duty. It is our charge that we teach the congregation the importance of knowing the lyrics and, of course, knowing the meaning of the lyrics. Secondly, teach the congregation confidence. It's our, our charge, our challenge to teach the congregation confidence. Okay, it's one thing to know the lyrics, but it's something else to know confidence. How do you teach confidence? Oh my goodness, this is an intangible. How do you teach something like that? You know how you do it? You set the example. If you're leading the song and it doesn't resonate as true in your heart, you're not confident. You have to have this. We have to teach the congregation confidence in what is being sung. The Bible says, and we're going to have to close with this, make a joyful noise. Psalm 96.2 says, bless his name. 
What does make a joyful noise? Somebody mentioned it earlier today. Sing loud. This means that you may not have a beautiful soprano voice or a tenor voice, the two high uh, registers, male and females, but you can sing loud with confidence. I serve a risen Savior. That's confidence. He's in the world today. You ask me how I know he lives, and you know the rest of the words, right? He's in my heart. This means that you may not have a beautiful voice, and you may sit in a congregation and you say, I don't sing well. And maybe your voice is, um, you're a male, you sing squeaky high. Or maybe you sing way down low. But we have to teach the congregation what it means to make a joyful noise. Interestingly enough, there's a verse in scripture about this. You can find it in the King James Bible. This is what it says. This is Psalm 81 and verse 1. To the chief musician upon the gitith. A gitith is a musical instrument. A psalm of Asaph. This is the author or the writer. Quote, here's the words of the lyric. Sing aloud unto God. Notice that it says aloud. It means loud. Sing aloud unto God, who is our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. See that? So this is what it means when it says make a joyful noise. It doesn't mean that you're giddy. It doesn't mean that you're absent-mindedly thinking about a cartoon that you saw. And number two, proclaim good tidings of his salvation. This is the phrase that comes out of Psalm 96 and verse two. And this refers to the content of the psalm, and therefore this is indoctrination. And with that, we are going to close this morning.